Well, I certainly wish I was in the audience right now to, to uh, get responses, to get reactions, but instead I am very uh, honored to be joined by the filmmaker uh, who was the director, writer, producer, editor, and dear friend, uh, Joe Ardinger, uh, thank you for being here. And we are also joined by one of the subjects of the film and certainly an expert. She's the senior legal and policy director for If, When, How, Sarah Ainsworth, welcome. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Joe, I, I have to start with you. This movie uh, was conceived many years ago, uh, but it went through a long gestation process uh, yeah. before arriving and becoming uh, fully and officially a film. How did it change over the years, I think eight years, uh, yeah. from what you first imagined? Yeah, what, so what I first imagined was that I was going to be making a film about how personhood laws impacted um, women's access to abortion care. And because that's how these laws were, are being used and, and in states across the country. But after doing um, you know, some research and learning more, um, I discovered stories where women were being criminalized for miscarriages or uh, certain behaviors while pregnant. And I thought that was um, a really compelling story. Um, I had never heard of that before. And I was really shocked to read those stories and that they were happening here in the United States. Um, so I thought, um, time to go down this tack because I hadn't seen anything like that before. One of the great challenges of that piece is obviously it, it, it shifted a little bit for you in that process, right? But it is, it's timely, it's topical and it keeps shifting as we go. So for the audience's sake, I, I'm sure we'd love to hear a, an update on Tammy and Harmonious uh, and, and anything else you care to share about them. Yeah, um, Tammy and Harmonious are doing uh, so well. Um, they're happy, um, they're a wonderful family and Harmonious is in school and doing really well. And Tammy is writing and I've been able to kind of witness over the years just how deep the trauma is from these experiences that people go through. Um, I've seen such a change in Tammy as the years have gone on, um, but that's been one of the really troublesome things to digest is just um, how awful this is for families to go through and how disruptive it is. And it was interesting, um, I was texting with Tammy the other day because she was talking to me about some writing she was doing and um, she was saying that these laws actually interrupt you and prevent you from being a good parent. And that's so true. You know, she was trying to do all the things to have a healthy pregnancy. And this law kind of stepped in and uh, prevented her from doing the right thing. And so she's still contemplating all of that stuff, but she's turned the corner for sure. It so Sarah, I'm going to turn to you because I, I'm hoping there's going to be a positive answer and you're going to tell me that since this film was made, uh, <laughs> women's rights have been solidified and uh, we're all good. So I, I so wish that I could say that and could answer um, with that positive frame. Unfortunately, um, the kinds of prosecutions that Tammy experienced um, continue across the country. Um, as the film demonstrates, um, the law in Wisconsin is pretty unique. So Tammy was actually not technically charged with any kind of crime. She was brought into custody under a law that allows for that. That's unique. But in other states, you see people uh, charged with various crimes and brought into jail um, for accusations that they've done something to either harm their pregnancy or even not harm their pregnancy, but do something while pregnant that society deems they shouldn't do. And um, even in uh, this current legislative session in the state of Arkansas, there's a law that would allow people to be charged with a misdemeanor if they say out loud while pregnant that they might use a drug. So there's a lot of First Amendment problems with a potential law like that. And it does make a lot of us kind of laugh and in shock that such a thing would be out there, but it's exactly that same thinking that um, once someone becomes pregnant, they lose civil rights. And the idea that a pregnancy, a person who's carrying a pregnancy is going to have a safer, healthier pregnancy in jail or incarcerated is 
so patently absurd and violates every precept of public health that it does make you wonder what is really going on? What are, what are people really trying to achieve um, with laws like this? Because it certainly isn't protecting the health of even fetuses, um, let alone pregnant women. Well, as a parent myself, I, I don't think there's any parent who hasn't considered drugs and alcohol at some point. <laughs> we said it. For <laughs> necessity, I've said it. Uh, uh, sadly, I think my rights are probably a lot safer uh, than others. Um, so at one point, Sarah, you say that the legal system can't make Tammy whole, right? Something to that effect. Is there anything that could or would make her whole? I mean, I think she would have to answer that question, but from our conversations, from my knowledge of her and from my other work experience, I have found that when people who've experienced something like this get three things, they are much more likely to heal from the experience. So the first thing is support from the people that they love. Um, so having a community around you, which Tammy really has had, um, has really been important for her. Um, the second is having decent health care. When, so that can be mental health care to help deal with trauma, and that can be the health care to help ensure that her health continues in all forms. And then the third is a sense of accomplishment in helping stop this from ever happening to someone else. And Tammy expressed that time and time again. And I, um, I can't think of any person I've worked with over the years who hasn't in the context of suffering a deprivation of their civil rights, wanted to make sure that it never happened to someone else ever again. And so letting their voice be a part of the advocacy to make sure that it doesn't is one element I think of healing. And, and it seems obvious to me, Joe, that's one of the things that you through this film have provided, right? Mm -hmm. you, you've given voice, you're telling this story. Uh, it's such an interesting contrast to those um, Wisconsin laws that are so private and cloistered and all the information is really hidden. Did you find yourself running into any walls in terms of what you could get your hands on in terms of information or access? Well, um, I had to do a little bit of wrangling to get the uh, recordings from Tammy's court session. So part of Tammy's um, lawsuit was to make, to unseal her records. And when that happened, you know, I was reading um, written transcripts of the court recordings and um, I wanted to hear it. And so I requested it and was denied it. And I had to write a letter to the judge and, and include the um, decision from um, the federal court that I was able to have access to these because it was under the juvenile court system. And so I, did, I got the CD of the tape and listening to it and hearing it, I mean, there's snippets of it in the film but when you hear the whole thing and then you hear them chit chatting back and forth uh, after Tammy's left the room, uh, it's so awful how she was disregarded as, as a person. Um, they were even kind of making jokes in the background and I just thought it was so offensive. And, um, you know, hearing that just that's so much more powerful than actually reading it on the page. And so I'm so grateful that, you know, I learned that I could get access to those and had, you know, the resources to make that happen. The, the, the mistreatment of Tammy in that process is, is, is clearly overwhelming. And, you know, it leads later to Sheree Scott uh, using the phrase rehumanize women, uh, which is, you know, just mind boggling because how is that even necessary. Uh, but in addition to the dehumanizing of women through that legal process, there was a stuff that was jaw dropping in terms of the legal system. Uh, part of the, one of those recordings, Joe, is the moment where Tammy's doctor says, uh, you know, what about confidentiality? And then that's just blown off. And yeah. I guess, Sarah, maybe you can tackle this. I, I'm confused by this loophole where all the rules seem to go out the window. I think it's very confusing too. And every lawyer that I've encountered besides the ones that were involved in the actual system and the federal judge in um, the lawsuit that Tammy filed um, was pretty stunned, 
pretty stunned to see not so much the dehumanization of women. Unfortunately, I think that's actually a common cultural phenomenon, but to, um, I think most people in this country have an understanding that due process is a, is a right. They have a sense of what it should be and what it should look like. And um, they also have a lot of clarity around the value of protecting your medical privacy, right? So I think to see that someone could go to seek the care that they desperately needed and then to be railroaded into court without legal counsel, to have a lawyer appointed or a guardian ad litem appointed for a, fet a 14 week old fetus, barely a fetus, still embryonic at that stage. Um, to see that I think is, is stunning. And the fact that I think what, what Joe was talking about, the secrecy is part of the reason why laws like that have survived as long as they do, because it's absolutely unknown. And when someone like Tammy goes through it, they're usually silent, ashamed and stigmatized. And so they don't share their story or have an opportunity to share their story in the way that they did through Joe's film. So I, I, this, this is, Next question is not about blame. I'm just trying to understand something in that moment. Was the doctor at fault for sharing the information or was the doctor essentially uh, had no choice in that moment but to? I, I think both things are true. Mm -hmm. I think the doctor violated the doctor's um, ethical obligations as well as their obligations under federal law. Unfortunately, people can't sue doctors under federal law for violating those privacy rights because there's no private right to sue. Sometimes in state courts you can, but you couldn't in Wisconsin. So it would be hard to hold that doctor accountable. At the same time, the doctor, I when I listened to the transcript, I heard the doctor saying, wait a minute, this doesn't seem right to me. And if a judge tells you a thing, well, of course you're gonna believe that. Um, or a lawyer tells you and the judge doesn't stop that lawyer. So in, in other ways, that doctor was not at fault. That doctor also was confused by the appear, it was something that appeared legal in nature and being told that that was acceptable. Um, and she really had no way of knowing that it wasn't. And she I, also didn't know that uh, the information that she was giving was going to be used to detain Tammy. Um, and that's something that I found out much later in the process after the film was put together, I, I, I heard that piece of information. And that that's, gets to what Sarah was just saying is that, you know, a lot of doctors are going along with what they're, you know, think is the law and that they're obligated for, but they don't really understand how it's gonna be used. I, I, I don't like to be conspiratorial or let alone sound conspiratorial, but this idea of the secrecy uh, certainly sets off some bells in my head. Uh, if, if a law is solid, why does it need to be that shrouded in mystery? Like a Danish mystery show. <laughs> Maybe we can both take a, a stab at that one, Joe, so to speak. Uh, so, um, you know, in this particular case, what is really insidious is that in every state, child welfare laws are set up to protect children who are born and alive in the world and to protect their interests. The child welfare systems typically um, shroud those proceedings in secrecy. So there's confidentiality of records. Not everybody can just come and watch hearings like that. Um, and so what Wisconsin did was use that apparatus um, to go after pregnant people who had not delivered any child. And there was, you know, Tammy was not a parent at the time. Tammy was a pregnant woman. Um, she had no other children. She was just pregnant. And, but it used, used that system in a way so it could use that confidentiality apparatus to, to hide these kinds of proceedings. And, you know, I don't, we don't even need to speculate. We know why Wisconsin adopted that law. They believed that there was a scourge of people using cocaine and giving birth to um, babies who were harmed by that. That was not accurate as a matter of science or so, so, social policy. And yet that's why they enacted it. And they picked a proceeding that they felt could give the state the maximum power to control the actions of a pregnant person. And they really succeeded with how they chose to um, meld these two systems together. I, I have a follow-up for that, but Joe, did you wanna chime in on, on the mystery aspect as well? 
No, it's just the same. It's exactly what Sarah said. And I, you know, every year Wisconsin publishes um, a child abuse report. And so I went in this year and I looked, uh, there's a, an appendix um, that's devoted to unborn children. So unborn child abuse. And so I, I looked at those numbers and there are still hundreds of women who are being scooped up under this law and it's applied um, differently across the state. <clears throat> Some counties are really anxious to apply the law and some don't, um, but it's hundreds of women and we, do, we don't know the outcome of those cases because it's still um, done in the secrecy of the juvenile court system. These efforts that seem to be led primarily by conservative, mostly Christian, mostly white men, not coincidental, uh, I, I, you know, Sarah, when you're talking about the Wisconsin laws or when we think about the, the crack baby epidemic or we think about, you know, um, uh, the pregnant woman uh, in the car accident and something like that, efforts to play off of that, are they as calculated as they seem or are they purely opportunistic? That is such a great question. Many of them are calculated. Some are opportunistic. So the prosecution of a... Um, the, the pregnant person you refer to who lost her own baby in a car accident and was charged with manslaughter for not wearing her seatbelt. I viewed that and everything I knew about it in the time we were working to defend her um, indicated that it was opportunistic and that there was just a desire to hold her accountable in some way for something. And this was the thing that the prosecutors creative, creatively attempted to use later a court of appeals said it was wrong and overturned it. But um, the thing in Wisconsin and other laws like it, uh, they are actually part and parcel of a personhood movement. The thing that Joe was going after initially um, when she started her film, the idea that um, wherever it appears in the law, there's an effort to define a person to include um, not just an unborn child, but a fertilized egg, an embryo um, at every stage of pregnancy, even from the time of conception. And then therefore, what you end up doing is creating a system where the person who is pregnant and carrying um, the fertilized egg, the embryo or fetus is no longer a full person with the full civil rights that all other humans have. Where the, it's so frustrating because we're the, <laughs> You know, I, I'd like to come up with some good explanation of things, and I'd like to think of oh, its compassion for the unborn child. Uh, but clearly, from Tammy's treatment in, in solitary and other uh, incidents that you document in the film, there really is no compassion for the kid's well being or for the unborn kid's uh, well being. So it leaves me with this question of what, what is the motivation? And, and is it just outright? Misogyny? I think it's to overturn Roe and it's to ban abortion. So as soon as you establish uh, that a fetus is a person, then abortion is murder. And this is one of those things that um, when you press uh, people uh, from the personhood movement um, on this question of, well, so if abortion is banned and um, will the woman who's seeking an abortion, would she go to jail and they, or be prosecuted? And they don't really wanna answer that question because the obvious answer is she should be under their law, right? But they know that's not appealing. And so one of the things that we saw in uh, Colorado is how cynical that was when they were using um, this really tragic car accident wh where um, this woman's you know, baby was killed right before birth they were using that to establish fetal personhood in Colorado because the legislature had already done uh, work on the criminal code that would enhance charges. They said that wasn't good enough because they wanted, it still didn't establish that unborn life um, had the legal rights to personhood. And so it is, it's really a ploy to ban abortion. I mean, that's what, that's what uh, everything that I've experienced, that's what I've come away with. Mm -hmm. You know, but the weird thing to me, and, and maybe sorry, you have an opinion on this too, is that I, I'd almost like to think that that's only, <laughs> that's the only explanation. Uh, 
but it seems deeper rooted than that to me uh, because it's punitive as well. It's not just about saving the unborn life, it's about punishing somebody, punishing the mother, which seems like an extra step driven by something else. Um, I, I, I do um, have an opinion. And I, th I think that, of course, there's the role of misogyny in opposition to abortion. And there are plenty of people who hold views opposing abortion who would not put themselves in that category, who um, in fact might call themselves feminists even, right? So I, not to disparage people with views against abortion, but to suggest that for some people who hold that view, there is a disparagement of women and a sense of punishment. Um, you put yourself in a sexual situation, you deserve the consequences. That is a common refrain. But also um, what we see is this deeply rooted misogynistic belief that the role of women is to be mothers and therefore a pregnant woman's role from the minute someone becomes pregnant or even before they become pregnant, but they have the capacity, it is their job to sacrifice their interests, their needs and their rights for the unborn child and then the born child and then their living child all their lives. And I remember um, there was an article and I can't remember if it was an article about um, this car accident um, that led to this issue in Colorado or if it was about another one of our cases because it's been a long time since I read this and I try not to read internet comments ever. But um, it, it, one of the commenters said, that some a, a woman they knew found out she had cancer while she was pregnant and she decided to go ahead and not get treatment and she died in order to give birth. And the comment was, that's a real woman. And I always took that and sat with that from there on, like, yes, that is one person's comment, but boy, that is deeply what is underlying this, right? That the belief that, you know, Tammy wasn't behaving like a real mother, like a real woman should. So she deserved to be incarcerated, even if, as you said, that's actually more dangerous for her pregnancy than anything else could be. Taking her away from the thyroid medication, even for one day, was increased the risk of um, miscarriage. And so there was just so many ways in which the state was actually putting that pregnancy at risk. And by separating it in, its, in theory from Tammy, but there's really no other explanation if you really, really drill down to what is expected of women um, in that worldview. Especially when they're calling women hosts in, in some of those uh, news clips that we have. So, you know, you can't, I don't think you can separate the misogyny from it and the desire to control women and to control women through reproduction um, and control women of color through reproduction has been going on, uh, you know, forever. It, it, it all seems all the more uh, absurd when, you know, America, which prides itself on being number one in things, isn't even number one in terms of maternal uh, health care. Uh, and, you know, our maternal mortality rate is way too high in this country. So it's not as even, even as, as if we're expediting better care uh, for the moms or the children. Uh, oh, so, <laughs> Sarah, this, this seems like a, uh, a softball for you, but I'm presuming that there are no laws out there that will uh, allow uh, men's rights to be uh, superseded and for them to become uh, charges of the state. Um, you are correct. And I would say that the only laws that I've ever been aware of over time that have been sim even remotely similar did not have to do with men's bodies, but had to do with stereotyping them so that when they, when they were caregivers or parents, they were denied certain benefits. And so Ruth Bader Ginsburg is famous for having argued one of those first cases to um, it, the federal courts and ultimately to the United States Supreme Court when she was still a lawyer um, to strike down those kinds of laws as a violation of the constitutional rights of men to equal protection for, to everyone on the basis of gender essentially. And so we don't have laws like that anymore. And but when it comes to men's bodies, no, that has never been um, a, an issue, with the small exception of men who've been incarcerated, and laws that affected their rights to procreate were struck down as unconstitutional in the 1950s, before Roe versus Wade, before even we women had the right to birth control. And I'd say the only 
policy thing that I've experienced in that regard is that men who are seeking vasectomies, if they're not, um, you know, over a certain age, um, they get a lot of pushback. Um, from the doctor. Um, some doctors won't perform it. And I understand the thinking behind that, but that's the only time that I can think of hearing somebody being restricted in that way. So I want to make this uh, sort of regional, if not local right now. Uh, recently, uh, we read that three Planned Parenthood uh, locations have uh, shut down or are shutting down in Washington state. Uh, I, I'm curious, how you take the temperature of Washington right now in terms of the personhood movement and, and women's rights. I can start and then Joe, yes, if you want to jump you. in. Yes, okay, sure, sure. sure. But certainly the legal part is, is um, more my terrain. Washington state is um, well known around the country for being very protective of reproductive health rights and justice. Um, and we have really strong legal protections and our strongest legal protection, which essentially made the law of our state in statute, the law under Roe versus Wade, that you have a fundamental right to choose to have an abortion or to carry a pregnancy to term. You have a fundamental right to choose or refuse birth control. Um, that was actually enacted by citizen initiative in 1992. And so we have, I think, not just a strong um, government at this time that protects the right to abortion, but we have um, a strong citizen history of being protective. And we were one of the first states to repeal our abortion criminal codes before Roe versus Wade was decided as well. So I think that, you know, for folks who are fighting for personhood, fetal personhood, Washington state is not an easy place to find um, that terrain. But you've pointed out something that is unfortunate, despite how strongly a state protects the right to have an abortion, there's very little constitutional protection for the right to access. And so abortion can remain out of reach for many people. Luckily in Washington state, Medicaid will pay for abortions, but um, the majority of states do not provide that coverage. So it's, um, but even if you have Medicaid coverage, there's still so much that goes into the time off work, the childcare you need. Um, the majority of women who have abortions are already mothers. So they're looking for you know, protection for their job. During COVID, things have been particularly hard, um, hard to get to a clinic. You don't wanna put yourself at risk. Um, so there's been a lot of work on the part of providers in Washington state to help provide access through telemedicine and other means. So, um, you know, it's not a bad, it's not a bad place to be in if you are wanting to ensure the civil rights of pregnant people. Um, and we are vigilant all the time to make sure that it stays that way. Thank you, Sarah. Yep. I don't know that I have anything to add off of uh, what Sarah said. Although the one thing I will say is that whether it's Washington state or somewhere else, you know, we keep, you know, our film is about um, a woman who was on the path to have a child. And yet we keep talking about abortion and we keep talking about um, this issue in terms of abortion because that's where the motivation comes from to, to make these laws. Um, so I guess I would just say that we should start talking about this issue in this fuller sense of how, you know, these laws have been applied to women who identify as anti-abortion. And, um, you know, I got an email from someone who said I was at every March for Life rally I could go to. I had no idea how these, how these policies create laws that make this happen. And so I think it's important for us to start talking about this issue differently, reframing this issue and access to abortion is critical. Um, but it's really so much more than that. These laws are rippling out into the lives of women. So um, even if you do have that protection in that regard, the mindset is still there to kind of push this into the lives of pregnant people. That's right. That's totally right, Joe. And it, it, the, the terminology that um, some of us use is um, pregnancy criminalization, right? Like taking when criminalization doesn't mean something's actually illegal, doesn't mean there's actually a law about it. It's using the existing legal apparatus to 
identify someone as doing something criminal in nature and punishing them in some way, which is what happened to Tammy. And again, Washington state is um, better than many other states in its history of not doing that um, to people, but it has laws on its books that could be misused in that way were someone to do that and go after someone. And so that's another place of vigilance for us um, who are trying to defend people's civil rights. So like so many things, it seems like a matter of uh, educating uh, people on all sides of an issue so they can see their impact, uh, no matter what their beliefs or faiths may be. Uh, it also seems like it's a matter of getting more stories like Tammy's out there. And Joe, thank you so much for, for doing that. But keep in mind, what's that stat at the end of the film that Cam Tammy's one of 4,700 plus cases uh, like that in Wisconsin alone, is that correct? even more since Tammy has uh, ex experienced this. Um, so many years have passed and it's still being applied, even though the law was declared unconstitutionally vague. It's still, it's still there to be um, enforced depending on who's in charge. And so what I'm hoping is that, you know, there is, there are efforts in Wisconsin to have the governor um, stop enforcing this law. Um, well, he's not enforcing it, but to make it so that the law can't be enforced. And I think that just, that's one of those things that I'm hoping that the film can be used, um, you know, because you know, if the attorneys don't know this law exists, then people on the streets certainly don't know uh, this law exists. And there's always footage that winds up on the cutting room floor, as they say. And I did a lot of those um, man on the street interviews. So not a single person I spoke with uh, around the uh, Madison and the state capitol knew that this was a possibility. Uh, no, there, and the only person who expressed support for it was a guy and he said, well, I suppose if uh, someone's doing something wrong, then yeah, they should be punished for it. And I think that's another thing is that it's all, we just need a readjustment of how we look at everything. Um, you know, we look at all of these social ills and social problems through this punishment model. And we're so keen on punishing people and you know, we, what we really need to do is look at people as humans and um, what are their problems and how do we solve them? And perhaps if Wisconsin had uh, done a Medicaid expansion, like many other states did at the time, Tammy would have had access to her medication that she needed. She would have been able to get her lab work, which is very expensive. And so that was out of reach for her and she made her own solution. And there are a lot of people in America who still need to do that. And so, you know, these are just all things that we need to start looking at, whether it's how we punish people or how we look at uh, this issue outside of abortion, even to the fact of making sure that um, kids get medically accurate sex ed. Wouldn't that make sense if, if we put all this effort into making policies like that? But even in a state like Washington state, there are places in the state where um, you know, Sarah, can you um, address that? Because I know a couple years ago, um, there were places where kids weren't getting medically accurate sex ed. Well, just this last session in Olympia, not this year, but last year, um, Washington State passed a law that oh, now for the first yeah. time, so in 2020, for the first time, it is now mandatory for public school districts to include medically accurate sex education in their curricula for our students. Uh, it seems like a long time coming, as it were. Uh, but uh, Joe, it sounds like there should be some sort of hashtag movement here uh, for uh, Tammy and others who've had uh, similar experiences to get uh, the word out there. But for those who uh, would like to know more about uh, personhood, uh, the film, and you yourself, where should they go? Uh, they can come to our website, it, which is www.personhooddoc.com. Um, we also have our, our Twitter and our Facebook feed, Instagram, at, it's at personhooddoc. Um, there is a fantastic organization uh, called Repro Action, 
and they're working in Wisconsin now and they do have a hashtag, which is hashtag WI Wisconsin fights 292. And you can look up repro action and find a, a petition that they have and you can sign it. Um, it's, it's meant for the governor. And so uh, those are a couple of really good resources. Looking at National, Advo National Advocates for Pregnant Women's website, they have all their current cases. I mean, they are everybody, uh, there is working on cases right now. This is not an issue that's, you know, disappearing. And, and Sarah, uh, do you want to tell us uh, a little something about If One How or, or what you hope people will uh, do? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah. So If One How Lawyering for Reproductive Justice is a national nonprofit organization um, that does a lot of traditional lawyering in the sense of filing lawsuits and doing policy fights in legislatures around the country. We also organize people who are in law school. Um, we have a, over 100 chapters throughout the country, including at the University of Washington and at Seattle University. University Law School, um, and a little group of students at Gonzaga are talking with us all the time. Um, it's a little bit of a struggle there to have a reproductive rights related organization in a um, Catholic university. So they're working on that. Um, but there are um, also fellowships that people can get post law school to work in reproductive health rights and justice organizations. So our view is that we're trying to transform the legal system from the seed to the canopy. So from law students all the way up to judges. Um, and what we're trying to achieve is an understanding that reproductive health rights and justice is about autonomy and self-determination, but also about the resources you need to determine if, when, and how to have a family and sustain that family with the resources you need to do that. And we have several um, initiatives we're working on. One of them is decriminalizing the people who self-manage abortion. And we just, um, a, a couple of weeks ago, got the American Bar Association to pass a resolution against using the criminal law against people like Tammy for anything they do during pregnancy, for pregnancy outcomes, for pregnancy loss, or for ending your own pregnancy intentionally. Um, and that's the first time um, that the ABA has ever pronounced something along those lines. And so we're really hopeful that that will also spur policy change um, around the country where it's needed. See, Sarah, you did have positive news. <laughs> <laughs> I did, you're right. <laughs> Thank you. And Joe, you've made a, a, a marvelous movie that critics have loved, audiences have loved, and Margaret Atwood said, told you so. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I will end on, on, on this uh, thought that, um, you know, in the film, they talk a lot about uh, the rights of the unborn child and about unborn, unborn child abuse and stuff like that. And as a survivor of uh, child abuse, I, I find myself really sort of disheartened uh, by it uh, because it seems so disrespectful of uh, those actually alive who haven't gotten the care that they need, uh, like so many of the women in the story and so many women beyond this movie. So I know that some people say that life begins at conception. I just like to argue that compassion shouldn't stop at birth. Uh, mm -hmm. So thank you for making a movie that uh, so gloriously puts those issues into focus and gets us to think a little bit more about the clear, inarguable rights of women everywhere. Thank, thank you, Joe. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Warren. Thank you, Joe.